Good afternoon. Um, I'm really pleased, those of you who were at this session in this room before, about um, problem solving. The speaker talked about we have to design problems to provoke learning. And what I'm following on is we need to design questions to provoke learning. I'm Theresa Smart. I'm from uh, University College London Institute of Education, but I'm working with QRTA on their program of, of teacher education. <coughs> um, I've been a teacher for far longer than any of you, and I've also had the privilege of working and observing in <coughs> hundreds of mathematics and science classrooms across the world. And I've got very interested in how we use our questioning, how we develop questioning to help students learn. Because teachers ask questions all of the time. Um, right. So that's who I am. And I try to talk as little as possible and get you to do things. So. On your table, there should be one or two envelopes. You're going to work in, so will somebody open the envelope? There should be two envelopes here. Yeah. yeah? Somebody open the envelope. And there's a set of statements in the envelope. And you look at the statements. They're about mathematics, but they're questions that scientists will need to know as well. And in pairs, you pick up a statement, and you look at it, and you consider whether the statement is correct or not. And are you sure? Do you have any doubts? You might want to think about arranging your statements. Are some true? Are some definitely not true? Or am I not sure? But can you work in twos or threes? Because you've got to be able to convince each other that what you're saying is correct. So for 10 minutes, can you pick a statement and decide whether it's true or not? And then move on to the next statement. <laughs> Introduces, thank you. I introduce you this, and we're going to come back to these questions later. Um, because I wanted you to get talking in your groups and ask each other questions. The nice question came there is Do we know about negative numbers? So, it's a very real point that if the students know about negative numbers, the answer to this question will be different than if the students don't know that negative Same with fractions. I think it's very interesting, as mathematics or as science teachers, we forget sometimes that we don't tell our students, our learners, what world we're in. So if we think of the examples, those who attended the previous session, um, if we ask a grade one or grade two pupil to divide 18 sweets among six people or three people, they will be able to do it and they will know when they've learnt division that this is possible. And we tell them, teachers tell them, that we can divide 18 sweets among uh, by three because we can share 18 sweets equally but we can't divide 17 by three because we can't share 17 sweets equally and in grade one and grade two we expect students to understand this and then we get to a grade three or grade four and the teacher will say, divide 9 by 4. And we'll get very upset when the pupil says, I can't. 
And we have told the people that today we're living in a world of whole number and fractions. So I'm expecting you to give me an answer. Whereas last year, I was living in the world of whole numbers and there was no answer. So as teachers, we have to be aware that we take for granted that what world we're living in at the time when we expect our students to give answers. But our students often don't. Okay. Um, so, where we put our statements will differ from what world we are. How much our students know. I'm going to come back to this, um, this problem later, but I want to move on. But I was very pleased you were working in groups and you were discussing. The science, there are quite a number of science teachers there. These were all mathematical problems. But asking students to discuss a statement and say whether it's true or not true, or any doubts, could be easily adapted to problems in science. And I hope that you can start to think about this. Um, okay. Right. I was provoked to thinking even more about questioning because I've used questions all my life in, as a teacher. And I've worked with trainee teachers and I've persuaded them to develop their questioning. But I saw this quote, and it was by a six-year-old, so I think first grade here, six-year-old, the son of a mathematician who was not happy in school with maths because the boy said, maths is too much answer time and not enough learning time. And I'd like you to think, just talk among yourselves. What do you think this little boy meant by this? What was going on in his class that he said this? Don't tell me, tell each other. Okay. Do you want to tell me what you're saying? Necessarily learning from this. Do you agree? Yeah? So, you agree from this? So, how are we going to change this? Well, let's just have some examples. I'm afraid I am, although my master's is in physics, um, I am a maths teacher most of the time, um, but I've, I've worked with quite a number of scientists and I've worked at research, so I hope I'm going to make it equivalent. Um, let's just go back. The ancient Greeks, Socrates and Plato, all believed you don't teach, you get students to learn by asking questions. Now, they were highly skilled at this, and they developed it, and they were quite incredible philosophers and thinkers. But I still like to hold on that it is possible that the knowledge won't come from teaching, but from questioning. He says he will recover it, but I think what is it? It's uncover it. He will find it for himself. So that's my ideal, is to think, how can my learners learn through me asking questions? Okay. 
what actually happens. When I looked at the research, it's quite worrying. Uh, teachers spend up to 50% of class time asking questions. And they ask between 300 and 400 questions a day. Yeah. Uh, each student asks on average one question per week. Yep. That is actually um, something for us to think about. And then we have research. This was research on questionings in 8th grade <coughs> mathematics classrooms. In Japan, in uh, Germany, and in the United States. And Japanese teachers accounted for 90% of the words spoken in the classroom. US teachers for 88, and German for 76. Okay, slight difference. But most of the time, the teacher is talking. So what we're going to look at today is how can we change that and how can we get more discussion, just like you were discussing earlier on, and how can we get students to talk and to practice. Okay. Um, I really are fan, uh, uh, feel important to just a simple step is to change the way we ask the question. So I could go into a classroom, and we're doing area and perimeter, and I can say to my students, find the perimeter of this rectangle. OK? Find the perimeter of this rectangle. Mm -hmm. Can you give me the answer? 30 OK, 30 centimeters. You've given the answer. Everybody else sits there and goes to sleep. <laughs> OK? Because she always answers the question. I don't need to think about it. I don't even know whether, okay? Instead, I can change that and say, give me two or more rectangles with a perimeter of 22 centimeters. All of you can give a different answer, right? Now you have to wake up. You can't rely on this good student to answer all the questions. A simple change of words from find the perimeter, give me two or more rectangles with a perimeter of 22 centimeters. We can describe this question as the first one is a closed question. The second one is an open question. So what do you think it means to change a mathematics problem from being closed to being open? What's the difference between these two questions? Yep. Rollins? So it's definitely you're going to have some wait time. Yeah. You need to wait for the students to yeah. think of it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Students that think, yes. You may involve more uh, number of, uh, of students. Yes. To appreciate uh, the open question, there is more than one possible answer. Yeah. For the In an open question, there's more than one possible answer. Do you agree with that often? Yes, open questions also may raise the Bloom's taxonomy level. Okay. From one practice to critical thinking. Yes, so that's like how the questions and what questions and how many, how, yeah. uh, what are the methods? Uh, how yeah, we can ask. Yes. It depends on the teacher to ask and um, make connection between concepts. For example, the parameter yeah. and the area. One more, yes. Open questions, yes. Um, have lots of different answers, several. You can all use different methods to find. I can ask 10 learners to give me an answer, and then I can ask somebody else at their table, do they agree or not? Um, and there are different ways of solving the problem. Thank you. Now, I'm going to start off with what you might think is a very simple question. What is 6 minus 4? Easy. Um, I could then say, give me two numbers with a difference of 2. You might also think, 
I wouldn't ask this question. It's so simple. But remembering what our colleague over there said, it's only simple when we live in the world of whole numbers. Um, there's a professor of mathematics education, Professor John Mason. He's written a lot. If ever you come across his books, there are some wonderful ideas there. And I was once talking to him, and he talked about this problem. He could go and ask this question in every single class in a school. Because if he asked it in a grade one or two class, then they would only give numbers between one and 10 or maybe one and 20. He could go to an older group of pupils and they've learned about fractions. And so he can expect them to give answers involving fractions or decimals or percentages. He could go into a class where they've now learned about negative numbers, directed numbers. And we can extend this word here. Then later on, what about when you get into the world of irrational numbers? You can then expect a whole new set of numbers involving irrational numbers. And finally, if you've learned about complex numbers, then there is an answer here. If you've learned about matrices, if you've learned about vectors. So this very simple problem turned into an open question can challenge at all levels. So I think we've often got to think about this because it depends in what world it's a loop. Okay, how many centimeters are there in a meter? Tell me two lengths that together make one meter. I've just used one meter, it could be five meters, it could be anything else. Okay, what is one fifth and four fifths? Give me two numbers that add up to one. Or give me two numbers that add up to a half. Or give me two numbers. Right. We don't think about this. It's very easy to make an open question on numbers. One thing I really want teachers to do a lot more of is, find, instead of finding the solution of equation, give me an equation whose solution is x. There are hundreds of equations whose solution is x. And it's wonderful to get learners to build up an equation rather than take it down. Okay. Can you, sorry, in your pairs, just a moment, first of all, write and I want you to write. Don't just sit there and pretend or wait for somebody else. <laughs> write a closed question and turn it into an open question. You could do it in science or maths, whatever. But write a closed question first of all. Hopefully at the end of the session, you'll all come and look at everybody else's question. But thank you. You've all shown, including a couple of ninth science questions. Um, yeah, write the name of two planets in the solar system. Um, how many planets do we have in the solar system is a closed question. Give me planets in the solar, give me two planets in the solar system. Okay, here we've got what is the area of this rectangular shape. Uh, draw two shapes with a particular area. Um, and here we've got, find the slope of the following line. And here we've got, um, what slopes make a pair of lines parallel? So we've turned uh, closed questions into open questions. It's important that you think of a closed question, first of all, because you need to know what is it I want to find out. I want to assess whether the students know about area or perimeter or solar system or um, electrons or, or whatever. But I'm going to change it into a question that has lots and lots of answers. And as teachers, 
we start asking just one or two open questions. And then as we develop the skills, we ask more and more open questions. Now, um, one of the colleagues here made a very important point. If I ask an open question, how do I assess the pupils? Because assessment's a big part. Because if I ask for two numbers that have a difference of two, am I happy if my grade six pupils just give me straight numbers? Okay? That's the role of a teacher. When we do open questions in the classroom, we ask, give me another. Anybody got a question, uh, an answer which is more challenging this one? So we get used to challenging our learners to always stretch beyond. And actually, I found um, that students like showing off. They like trying to, but we have to encourage them. Um, okay, so one strategy as a teacher is to always think, when I'm going to ask a question, because I want to assess, do they know um, about the solar system? Do they know about parallel lines? Can I ask them in a way that allows lots of different answers? So that um, when one colleague gives an answer, the rest just, OK, they go back to sleep again, because they won't get asked. Whereas if you've got an open question, you can ask everyone in the classroom and expect them to give you a different answer. What I want to do is to move on and think of other strategies that I've used or I've seen teachers use in the classroom. And this is a closed question. This is a question, um, find 12.5% of 240. Now, I don't know about you, and I know um, everybody's got calculators now, but <coughs> when I was working full-time in a school or at a university, when it comes to exams, every other person, every other teacher of every other subject comes and says, Teresa, I've got to work out percentages. I've got to work out my results. And I can't remember what do I multi what do I I know I've got to divide one number by another number, but I can't remember what to do. Maybe you don't, maybe all your teachers know, but I'm constantly asked by people about percentages. Because they learn they've got to divide one by another, but they don't know why or wherefore. So I'm going to tell you a story about a class I went. It was a grade five class, which is primary, it's the end of primary in England and the teacher was working with the pupils on percentages and she was aware that the pupils would learn things off but don't really think about it. So she started off with the statement and it was a very open question. She said 100% is 240 and to me what was important is was that Often we don't realize percentages about uh, what is the whole thing, what was 100%. So she just said, okay, 100% is 240. Said to the class, what do you know? Tell me anything you know if I say 100% is 240. So, with a bit of encouragement, because this class was being videoed, with a bit of encouragement, come on, whatever, is that one pupil said, well, I know, 50% is 120. Because if 100% is 240, 50% is 120. I know, um, if I know 50% is 120, I know what 5% is. I know what, what else do I know? If I know... 50% is 120. What else do I know? 25%, yeah. I know is, why do I know this? Yeah, 
because if I half this, I've got to half this. Yeah, so 12.5% is 30. Do I know anything else? What about 200? Okay, um, I could do 5% first, so that's what these students did. They didn't quite get to 1%. So they said 5% is, how do I find 5%? It's 12, why? Fifth of this, fifth of this is 12. So 1%, what do you think 1% is? Okay, so I know what 1% is, I know what 200% is, I can keep on forever because I could say 56%. Okay, because I know 50, I know 1, so I can find 56%. I can do um, 400%. I can do, um, I can find anything. And these students got really into it. They just kept expanding. And once they knew what 1%, they could find 2%, they could find 3%, they could find any number you wanted. The most important thing is those learners understood what 100% Okay, then because the teacher wanted to make sure that it, they couldn't just do it when she was leading, on the table they all had big pieces of paper, but also she was aware that some pupils were happy with decimals and fractions and some weren't because she chose this table was struggling with fractions. So she gave them 100% is 400. This table there was very good. So she gave them 100% is 36. Okay. This table here were fine, but she gave them something like 100% is 480. Okay. Can you see? One simple question, what do you know? And there's no end to the answer. You can keep filling this in. Um, I went away from this and I thought, you know, um, we could use this idea for lots of other things. We could use this idea if we wanted to convert from, in England, we still work in miles. Here, you work in kilometres. So we could have eight kilometres is the same as five miles. But then I went to talk to some other teachers and I thought, okay, what about the solution of an equation is x equals 3? Remember, this was an open question. Give them some idea. If I know the solution is x equals 3, what could the equation be? I could have x minus 3 is equal to 0. I could have 2x equals 6, and then 2x minus 3 equals, I could populate this whole thing. Um, and so I then went to work with, and I showed this video to a whole set of teachers and said, how would you use this in this classroom? And they went back and tried different ideas. So we've got some nice colored card. Um, in groups, can you choose an activity? How would you use this activity with a class that you're teaching? And draw it up and fill it in. Okay, work in pairs. Can you, um, yeah. I like working in colored card. Okay, come on. No time to waste. Choose an activity of your own.
Oh, sorry. I forgot one. Qu oh, no, I'll come back to this later. Make up your own question. Yep. Yep. Um, it, it'll be an open question. So it could be one whole equals 60. Or solution is, or a percentage one, just, or five miles equals eight kilometers. Just make up your own question where you're given a statement and you then draw out everything else you can say about it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I know this, what else do I know? That's what you have to try, yeah. Huh? If I know the answer is this, yeah, yes, um, yeah, um, I don't know because I'm not a language teacher. <laughs> You're a maths and physics. <laughs> maths and physics. <laughs> yeah. Yep. I'm trying to create this to cancel. Yeah. So I'm looking about this question to have it as an open one. The electronic configuration is to be this one. Yeah. But actually, the only problem that I have the student is going to stick on finding but there is nothing to extend later from the answer we given, which is given okay. to the question. Then in this, this case, that's fine, that's okay. fine, yeah. In this case, that's fine. In mathematics, in these, there are always lots of answers. Yeah? Yeah? Give me an example about mammals, one mammal, or one insect. This is an option. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and that it's... Uh, well, what I would say, give me an example of and then what else do I know? Then you'd have to say a mammal's got four legs or whatever. It's trying to find out everything they know about. Okay. Uh, I didn't give you very long on this um, because I'm a maths teacher and I'm being challenged, which is good, to help think about what this means for science. Um, so thank you very much for, for this. Um, this is a different type of way of working. What we're doing here is we're giving our learners the answer. And we're asking them what the question could be. Yeah? So it was 100% is 240. So we want, what else do you know if that's the case? So we had a question here is, the answer is a lion. So the question could be, give me a, yeah, okay, give me an example of a carnivore animal. The question could be, give me an animal with four legs. Yeah. Yeah, lots of questions that give this answer, okay? And they have to know everything about mammals and animals and properties. I'm much easier, so thanks very much. We had one here about electronic chemical um, systems. I find it much easier to give mathematics problems. <coughs> but I'm learning a lot every time I do this with scientists as well, so thank you very much. <coughs> now, okay, can we go back to the, where we started with your um, activity when you started, came into the classroom, you worked in groups, these statements. Um, you as teachers immediately came up with, well, this works, it's true certain times, it's not true others. But, yeah, but our learners, 
We've got to help them decide. Because often they want to say it's true or it's not true. They want a nice, clear answer. So let's just look at one of the activities. x squared greater or equal to x. And let me redefine the question. Let me say instead of, is it true or false? Let me say, is this true sometimes, always, or never? Now, in mathematics and in science, these are really challenging questions. They really do make your students think. So this is looking at a set of activities where we can change our questioning into, is this statement true? Always, sometimes, never. Now, if it's mathematics, I know what to do. And if the problem's a bit difficult, this is a strategy I can use. So you're my class, I ask this question. And then I say, OK, right, can you give me a value that makes this statement true? So can you give me a number? 1. 1 squared, it's equal to 1. Or, yep, yeah, um, give me another one. 5. 5 squared, 25, is bigger than 5. Can you give me another one? Negative 2, 4 squared, um, negative 2 is 4. It's bigger than minus 2. OK? Right. Then, you've gone into fractions and negative numbers, but if my learner hasn't, I will then say, try a fraction. Try a decimal. But you're only looking for ones that make it true. Now, that becomes a bit more challenging with some of your learners. OK? Can they find a fraction that makes it true? Can they find a decimal number that makes it true? Can they find a negative number that makes it true? OK, now I'm beginning to think it always works. So then I say, can you give me a value that makes the statement false? OK, um, that table there. You've got a value that makes it false? One over two. OK, why? Yeah. OK, so a half. Can somebody give me a decimal that makes this false? A decimal, 0.2. Because 0.2 is not 0.4. It's not 0.4. OK, um, so I can, can anybody give me a negative number that makes this false? Minus a half? Oh, OK, one moment. Um, somebody's here who's a science teacher, we've got to remember, biology teacher, says negative half. You say immediately. Let's just listen, OK? Can you convince my colleague here as to why negative half doesn't work? greater than negative number. So although a half makes it false, minus a half is true. Now, if we work through this, and this will take some time with your students, it won't just happen like that. You've got to explore different numbers. Now, can you state precisely? Now, it's quite difficult to say in words. So do you think this is correct? Um, I think it's true because you've said it works for every number bigger than 1 or equal to 1. It works for all negative numbers. And it doesn't work for fractions between 0 and 1. And that's quite difficult to say in words, but it's very easy to say in diagrams. Um, I'll hand these out later, but... These are 
the solutions of the cards you've got. I haven't cut these up. Um, and the task will be to match a solution with a card. Okay? So this activity, if you're a mathematics teacher, and I like being a math, sorry, I've taught some physics, but I prefer to teach mathematics. Um, because I love mathematics. Um, I think I can get a lot of rich discussion, a lot of arguments, a lot of ideas in my mathematics class using an activity like this. Because it's not straightforward. Is it true? Sometimes, always, never. If I look back at here, it gives me a strategy to work it out. And remember, your pupils don't have your experience as teachers. They need some structure to them. Um, OK. Now, before we go on to do some more examples, because I've got some more activities to give you, um, let's look at what the research says. Because I could talk to you forever. I could say I've used all of these activities in my classroom and they made a big difference to my learners. <coughs> I think it's quite important to see <coughs> what the research says. So, research shows that effective questioning has the following characteristics. Effective questioning means it helps learning. So your six-year-old will feel they're learning even if they're answering questions rather than just answering questions. Okay. When I was training teachers, and I've done quite a lot, this is the hardest thing. Um, because teachers, we're used to going into the classroom and we just think of questions then. We teach them something and then we just ask them questions. Whereas effective questionings, questions, they need to be planned. You need to think, what do I want? Remember, those of you who were here earlier on, um, the speaker talked about setting up situations that provoked learning. And somebody asked, but that takes quite a lot to ask the right problems to provoke learning. And my advice to teachers when you start is just plan one or two questions that you're really going to ask and <coughs> to provoke learning. And then you get better and better at it. <coughs> so questions are planned and they change in difficulty. <coughs> okay. um, open questions predominantly. Every time you think about, oh, I want to ask about mammals, uh, chemical um, formula, or whatever, uh, or uh, ne negative numbers, can I ask an open question rather than a closed question? A climate is created where learners feel safe. What do you think? What does this mean? Yes. Do you agree? Sam is saying is the teacher creates that making a mistake is a good thing because it exposes what the student's thinking. So the, the learner, your learners need to feel safe. They need to be able to offer and they won't just get put down and laughed at. So I think this is quite important. and the method they use. Following on from that, a no-hands method. Because, okay, 
sorry, I keep using the same colleague there. She answered the question first on percent on a perimeter, and the rest of you could keep quiet. So rather than, I won't allow you to put your hands up. I'm going to choose, or we've all got a piece of paper, and I'm going to say to you, give me two measurements that make a meter. You're going to write it on your board. You're going to write it on your piece of paper. At any moment, you're going to say, show me. And I'm not going to say, you're wrong, you're right, you're right. I might go to say, okay, do you agree with this student here? She says so-and-so. What do you think? Okay, so that, these two go together. This is quite important because, to me, it's not the answer that's important. It's how you got to the answer. Can you explain your answer is important. Somebody asked... Yes, Donna? Yeah. yeah. So it's back to what you were saying earlier on. How do we assess their level? We want them to give an answer that's that challenges them. So, whereas I'm happy that Dana gives a simple answer, because I know that's what she's capable of, and she's learning, whereas I'm expecting Othman there to give a more complex answer. Okay? Now, somebody mentioned this earlier on, wait time. important we allow students to think yeah wait time yeah 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 um, but also <coughs> how many times have we as teachers or have we seen when we've gone into other teachers class the teacher asks a question and okay will you answer the question for me and you're thinking. And I immediately say, okay, will you answer it? Whereas I, w I should wait for you to give me an answer. I like these two down here. Learners are encouraged to collaborate before answering. One class I went into when I was doing a lot of observing of teachers, it was a grade five class, so grade four or grade five, and the teacher would pose quite challenging questions and every pupil in that class had a talk partner. Yeah, or share partner. The teacher would say, ask a question, talk to your talk partner first of all. And agree the answer, then give the answer between you. And remember our first slide, almost our first slide. Students ask a question once a week. Whereas teachers ask three or four hundred a day. Encouraged to ask their own questions. I was once in a science class and the teacher had set up every science lesson with this class. This is what happened. Um, they were asked to read their notes, their learning from the other lesson. And they knew when they first came to the class, the teacher would go around and just say, you and you and you, and you. And they knew that later on, they had to stand up, choose another student, and ask them a question on, based on their homework. So he was encouraging the students to, so they all had, because they didn't know who was going to be asked, they all had to do their homework, they all had to think about their homework, so Dana would say, <coughs> would ask student over there, tell me what an open question is. Yeah? And assess their answer and have a discussion. Yeah? Yeah. 
Yep. Yep. So it's, um, yeah, there are lots of ideas here for you to take up and try. My advice is you try one at a time and then gradually you see you're trying them all. Okay. I like the whole sense of show me. Um, and we don't just get one answer. We could be show me two fractions add up. Now show me a different pair and a different pair and a different pair. So all of you can have different numbers and lots of different pairs. An equation of straight line that passes through the point two one. Show me another. Show me another. Okay. Now, what I think we're seeing is we're moving away from the teacher asking questions to the teacher having a dialogue with learners and learners having a dialogue together. So, um, this is based on some research that took place in a science classroom. And the researcher went into lots of science classrooms and investigated. So the simplest type of um, questions is initiation. The teacher asks a question. Um, which has an answer. Uh, in what does the Pluto lie in the solar system? The pupil responses, and the teacher says, yes, correct, good, very good, whatever it is, and moves on to the next question. So you've got the answer, and you've no idea what the answer is, but you haven't learned. Move on from there, IRF. Teacher asks a question, the learner answers, and there's some follow-up. It could be the follow-up, um, why do you know this? Um, is there another answer or whatever? But the teacher just doesn't accept the answer. They probe a bit more. Um, a better way is the teacher asks the question, the learner responds, the teacher uses the answer to follow up with another question. The learner responds, then it just keeps on going like this. Now, um, after this researcher observed, oh, 30 um, teachers at all levels looking at interaction in science classrooms. This was one of the summaries they found. The teachers help students develop understanding through a process of negotiation, question, answer, probing, rather than transmission or confrontation of misconceptions. Teaching strategies included soliciting students' conceptions. And I've picked out three important points that I thought that rang a bell with me. And these three points are restating student utterances, and we're going to talk about this in a neutral manner, using reflective questioning, and invoking silence. And I'm just going to look at these for a moment. Revoicing. I've tried to do this a few times, although I keep forgetting, but I've tried to do this a few times. Is the teacher restates or revoices what the learner has replied to a question? Now, I know in mathematics, if I ask a slightly complex question, not a, a question that doesn't have just a one-word answer, 
the student will say, well, you know, it's if we have this and we have that, and they're pointing and they're using sort of very um, vague language. Or they're talking quite quietly, or they're hesitant. But I think they understand. So I will say, as I, I did once before, okay, Hussam is saying this, this, this. It's a neutral manner. I'm not saying Hussam is right or wrong. I'm just trying to revoice what Hussam has said so that the pupils in that corner there can hear. Because Hussam is facing me, he's speaking quite quietly, and I think what he's saying is quite important. So I revoiced it, I restate it for everybody. And then I might say, do you agree? Yeah? Yes? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I think this is quite important. Sometimes revoicing it and then Hussam will say, no, I, I didn't mean that. And we'll say it more clearly. This is particularly important in mathematics and science because mathematics and science use precise language, whereas Hussam doesn't use precise language. So I'm helping, and this is a strategy we should be using more and more and more, not only for the learning of the whole class, but to help students um, learn to speak in full sentences using correct scientific and mathematics language. Okay? So revoicing, restating is an incredibly important strategy in questioning. Okay. Reflective questioning, in a way it's what you were saying there. Um, Hussam said something. Sorry, Hussam, you don't mind, do you? And I think he's misunderstood. So I might say, so Sam said this equation has no solution. And so I say, you say this equation has no solution. Is this because you don't know how to solve it or because you know it has no solution? So I'm reflecting the question back with another question. Or I'm using questions to help the students reflect on their learning. So I'm saying, OK, why? Can you explain your answer? Can you tell Othman why you think this is correct? Or over there, do you agree with? But asking students to explain um, whether the answer is right or wrong, and the important thing, it's all done in a neutral manner. Right back. So reflective questions. We reflect the question back to the students. Yeah, 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 yes. And we also use questioning to help the students reflect on their learning. Invoking silence. You all were trying to find what on earth she's saying about this. So what do we say? We're all going to sit in silence. Um, I once saw an amazing lesson. It was many years ago. And the teacher had um, challenged the pupils to think about a problem. And the problem was, if everybody in this room shook hands or greeted everybody else in the room, how many handshakes would there be? Okay, so that was the problem, and the students then were sitting in tables like this, and he said, okay, in your groups, think about how you're going to answer this question. So, that table over there got into a real discussion. Uh, so, one of them said, Roller said, okay, 
if I shake hands or I greet everyone on the table, then um, you don't need to greet me because I've greeted you. Whereas another student on that table said, yes, but I think Roller will shake greet one, two, three, four, five times, and I will greet five times, and everybody will greet five times, and they had a debate. Is Roller's suggestions correct, or is your suggestion correct? So they called the teacher over, and they explained. Roller said, I think it's this. And um, the other student said, I think it's this. And they looked at the teacher, expecting an answer. And the teacher just stood there with a nice look on his face, as if he was interested. And, and then gradually, they started discussing among themselves. And they decided they were going to take Rollers. He didn't say a word. Yeah, no, the teacher didn't say a word. And they thought it out between them. Any of you who read, I read a lot of detective novels and various things. Some of the best detectives, they interview a suspect and they ask some questions and the, they think the subject is clearly not telling the truth and they just sit there. And gradually, the person starts to keep explaining, explaining more. So keeping silence is an incredibly powerful tool. It's quite hard. And I once saw a science lesson, again a science lesson, uh, <coughs> and um, the, a student asked a difficult question. Um, a student asked quite a difficult question. And the teacher just stood there on his hand and looked like he was thinking. And he thought for at least 90 seconds, which is a long time. And it was quite transformational because for the students it was important that teachers don't have answers all the time as well. He had to think about it. And then he thought out and he said, okay, I've got it and use questions then to help them answer the question. So it's very difficult. We're frightened of silence in the classroom because if we are silent, the kids might erupt or they might think we're no good or whatever. But I found if you can get the courage to just keep silent, the students sometimes think things out for themselves. Or you have time to think, how will you answer this question? So out of those three things, I find this really quite important. OK, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very good, yes. So. We've got a bit of time left. Um, I'm afraid these are all for mathematics, but I know you can extend them for science. We're learning now, after all of this, is that we don't just want to ask questions, even open questions. We want the students to talk. We want them to argue. We want them to discuss. So there are examples of activities that help students. Um, okay, I think there's two for every table. So, activities which you can develop for science, matching activities. Um, Changing the question from is it true to is it true sometimes, always, or never. So I've got a pack of activities, and I'll tell you where they come from. 
you might want to look at them. There should be two. Are there two for every table? Yeah. The first two activities are matching. What's the value of this? You've got all different representations of fractions, decimals, percentages. Can you match them together? The third activity is, is this statement true? Sometimes, always, never. That's a green activity. And on the back, there are some hints to help you. So just for the last few minutes, can you have a look at these? And there are some empty spaces in your cards. Um, so if there aren't enough, you, could, you, have to find, you have to write what should be there. Um, normally, you'll cut these out, just like I cut out. Um, yeah. So what you want to do is you need to keep them separate. So those activities are matching algebraic functions with their words. Those are matching fractions, percentages, and scales. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we have this is uh, run out of time, but I can show you where you can find these activities. <laughs> um, the important thing is. Matching, students have to discuss, they have to argue. Normally I cut the cards up and they'll have to match them all. And in doing so, they've got to convince each other. They've got to know, so the whole group will work on the cards and they've all got to agree. And as a teacher, you go around and say, pick up two cards and say, for Sam, why do you match these two? Because I've seen this, I'm just sitting there and speaking. And they're doing the work. Um, so everybody in the group has to learn. Um, these are examples, but you can make your own cards um, with different functions, different equations, different graphs. Um, it's very straightforward. Um, time always goes much more quickly than I really hope. Um, but I believe that if we use some of these ideas in our maths classrooms or science classrooms, then instead of maths is too much answer time and not a lot of learning time, we'll have maths is lots of learning time and less answer time. Um, so I'd like to say thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and this will go up. Um, these came from a pack of materials, and this is the pack, this is the reference with information about it, and this is the reference that allows you to download the materials and read the materials. Um, but there are only a few examples of matching cards, but teachers who use this pack have then gone off and made all their own activities. But matching, or sometimes always never, means your classroom will be full of discussion and full of learning. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I really